pastors here, um, and so thankful that you joined us today. If you would, take a moment and fill out that card that you should have been given on your way in and let us know that you were here today. Uh, stop by the booth on the way out. We've got a, a gift for you. I just want to thank you for being a part of our service today. Um, if you're looking to connect in any way to our church, take steps beyond Sunday. We have a connection center over here as well to help you do that. Um, today after service, we're going to have um, a baptism, and so I would encourage you to stick around for that um, after the service. Um, also, this coming Saturday, there's going to be um, a time to work on this property. We got some mulch, so you need to like get your hands dirty. You're done with your Christmas shopping, so you got nothing else you're doing. So some of you need to show up on Saturday morning. What time, Greg? 8 o'clock. And uh, help us kind of prepare the property for Christmas, Christmas Eve service. And so we got some mulch to lay down, a couple, got the fence to paint, got to finish up that. So if you can just donate some time Saturday morning, you'll have a huge mansion in heaven. Like, <laughs> so big. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, real quick, also, thank you. Last week we did Christmas on Chrome. And, uh, you know, so it was a good time out here. We were able to give about $650 to our mission partner in Haiti. Uh, as he's there serving with um, children and reaching youth there. And so the, the hot cocoa and the donations for the cookies and the shirts and all that stuff we're able to send to them. So thank you for those of you who contributed to that. Um, also, when you give here, it, it opens up and enables us to be able to give to opportunities that you may not know of. Um, and so this past week, there was a fire in Cutler Bay in an apartment complex. And um, what you may not know is John Michael Gibson, who is a... A pastor of a church called the Village Church there. He just moved here to start this church. We gave him all of our chairs. We used, not these chairs, we got nice ones now. <laughs> we had these chairs we met in a school for years and we gave them to him so they could start a new church in a school. Well, he lives in that apartment complex. So he's on the second floor and it was the third floor that caught fire. And um, so he's been provided for and taken care of, but he said, I want to help take care of all the third floor and the people who lost food and everything in there. So we were able to contribute with some other churches and give hundreds of dollars worth of food car, uh, gift cards away to them so they can help restock and provide the food and get, get, just get them through this, this time. So thank you for being generous and giving here. So as you not only look for opportunities to give in your own life, as you give here, it enables us to be able to be good news to people like that as well. Okay, so thank you for doing that. Um, and then last thing, I swear, I promise, there is... Um, gifts, we're supporting foster families, and there's some more families, um, there's some more gifts out there, some tags, uh, gift cards are needed to provide, to help provide for foster families, so if you want to pick up one of those and um, get that gift card, you can either return that today or tomorrow at the latest. Uh, if you grabbed a tag before, today's the day to bring that gift in to support those foster kids. We're working with other families across the county to make sure that foster kids and families are helped and supported in this season, Okay. All right, now, if you have a Bible, take it out, because it's going to get hot in a little bit. So, if you need a Bible, slip your hand up, and these guys will be glad to bring you one. We're going to be in John chapter 6. If you are new around here, we are going through the book of John. Um, we started uh, about a month or so ago, and we're going to be heading all the way to Easter. And so, we're going to be in John 6 today, in the series we've entitled Encountering Jesus. And we've been looking at people... In situations where people are encountering Jesus and the book of John is continually trying to get us to ask who do you say he is who is Jesus do you believe in Jesus will you trust in Jesus and so today we get into chapter 6 and it's on page 520 or 988 depending on which Bible they handed you um, and we're gonna be reading verses 35 through 40 35 through 40 all right are you there if you're there, say, I'm totally there. John 6, 35 through 40. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son 
and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Thank you, Adele. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you have ordained that we would be here today through all the things that we're going through in life, ups, downs, joys, sorrows. You've placed us right here and you have provided for us the scriptures that have been preserved generation upon generation so that as we read them and listen to them and encounter them, that we can encounter the God of the universe. And Lord, I know that there's an enemy who prowls around, who loves to discourage, who loves to divide, who loves to speak lies into our mind that that you don't care, or that you're not good, or that we don't matter to you. And so Lord, I pray that you would crush those lies. I pray that you would grant us courage to see the truth of your scripture. I pray that you would grant us faith in this place. God, forgive us for being a people who run to so many other things to satisfy our souls and return us to you again, oh God. As we open your word, let us feast, let us realize where the true life is found, and let us have no longer increased desires for things that don't matter. Grow us in this very place today. Mature us in these moments together. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let me ask you a question as we begin today. What are you hungry for? What is it that you are hungry for? I mean, with the holiday season upon us, there's usually an increase in hunger, especially for specific kinds of foods. There's certain foods we only eat during the holidays, right? I mean, when when Thanksgiving rolls around, it's like now is the time for pumpkin pie. Like, you don't eat pumpkin pie in July. If you do, you're weird. Okay? So you can walk out of here going, I'm weird. Cool. Like, Christmas, right? Candy canes. You don't see people eating candy canes in June. If you do, you are good. Good job. Right, there's, there's just certain foods that we begin to, to crave and we hunger for those, and hunger is powerful. Hunger shapes your life. Your life will be shaped by what you hunger for and how you respond to that hunger. And we know around the holidays that if you hunger for too much, your life will be shaped in such a way <laughs> that you'll need new pants in January. You ever go to the grocery store when you're hungry? Big mistake, right? Big mistake. You start buying all kinds of cookies and cakes and things that end in Edo's. (laughs) We're shaped by our hunger. Girls who hunger for attention will begin to dress a certain way. Guys who hunger for approval will start to boast about themselves in a certain way. People who hunger for more money will overwork and neglect their families. What are you hungry for? Some people say, well, I'm just hungry for some peace. Like, it is just so chaotic in my life, and this year has been filled with just stress and more and stuff and pressures and pains and and more of this and more of that. Like, I just want it to be like, ah. So what do you do with that hunger for peace? See, some people take that hunger for peace and they start to develop habits of escaping. So we escape to too much food, too much alcohol, sexual addictions, too much sports or entertainment, and we just escape because we just want it to be. And you know what happens when we start to fill ourselves with those things? We get full, but never satisfied. We're full, but we ain't satisfied. Like when you're driving home and you're hungry and you stop at McDonald's instead of going all the way home to make something fresh. You fill yourself with something that's got no nutrients. Now I bring all this up because in John 6, we're looking at a text today and next week 
where Jesus comes along in verse 35 and he says to this massive crowd, he says, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I'm the bread of life. It's the first of seven statements that Jesus makes in the book of John where he says, I am, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd, I am the door, I am the light, I am the vine, I am, these are the things he says. And so, here's the first one, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Come to me and there won't be any more hunger. He's claiming to be the one who satisfies your hungry soul. He's saying humanity hungers. You have hunger. That you are born needy. You have needs. And I know we live in Miami. We like to pretend like we don't. And we like to portray an image like we're good. But when Jesus says he's the bread of life, it means you need something. You hunger. You have need. And Jesus is saying, I'm the one that you need. I'm the one who satisfies your hungry soul. So I want to look at what this means for us, because Jesus is telling us about himself. Remember, John's trying to say, who do you say Jesus is? And he says, I'm the bread of life. And so we're going to look at this in the context of all of chapter 6. Now listen, there are 70 verses in chapter 6. That's a lot, okay? That's a big loaf of bread, all right? So we're going to get through half the loaf today. We're going to back up at the beginning and eat half of this loaf of bread, and then we're going to eat the other half next week. And let me just tell you, as the chapter goes on, the oven gets hotter and hotter. Jesus turns up the heat through this chapter. So, three realities about Jesus I want us to see. Here's the first. Jesus will test us beyond our capacity. Jesus will test you. Jesus will stretch you. Jesus will push on you. Jesus will bother you. Jesus will intrude on you. Jesus will stress you out. He will test us beyond our capacity. Now, we like to think of Jesus as this nice guy, right? We love Christmas because, like, he's a baby in a manger. Like, that's harmless. No crying he makes. Like, who wrote that? That's a lot. What a lyric is that, right? No baby. Jesus cried as a baby. Cried as an adult, too. When he says he's the bread of life, we hear that. We're like, yes, I like that because I like bread. Who doesn't like bread? We all, all cultures like bread. And some of you are like, well, I don't because it's all carbs and I'm trying not to, you know. We got Cuban bread, we got French bread, we got Italian bread, we got white bread, we got wheat bread, we got Hawaiian bread. Pasta's like noodle bread. Donuts is like breakfast bread. I mean, we're always wanting bread, right? Jesus, I'm the bread. We're like, yes, I like that. Let's see where he's going with this. Why did he say I'm the bread? Back up into chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1, where this comes from. And so in chapter 6, verse 1, it tells us this. It says, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Its name was changed to that later. And verse 2, a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Now, John, in, in his gospel that he's written here, is, tells us these different signs. Jesus would do a miracle. He would do a sign, and that sign was to show people that he was God who came for them. But often he would do that, and then people would be divided over, like, well, who is this guy? Is he this? Is he this? And that happens over and over and over again throughout the book of John. And so he was doing these signs. He was healing the sick. And so, verse 3, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. And he would sit down, and that's where he would teach them and and speak to them. So verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. That was a celebration, a remembrance of what God did back in the Old Testament when the Jewish people were enslaved to Egypt, and God said, I'm going to deliver you, and I'm going to pass over you, I'm going to show grace to you, and judgment's going to come upon Egypt, and that's going to be the way that I'm going to deliver you out of their slavery and oppression and injustice. And so they, were celib- they would celebrate this feast every year. And so verse 5, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him. Now how large is this crowd? 
Well, if you look down in verse 10, it tells us that the men sat down about 5,000 in number. Now, what they would do back then is they would count, they would only count head of household, right? Churches like to count every single number. Back then it was just, let's count the head of household. And so this was 5,000. Well, head of household means they think this crowd was probably closer to 20,000 people. So if you've ever been to the American Airlines Arena, maybe for a heat game or a concert or something, that seats about, I think it's like 19,800 people. Okay? So Jesus looks up and sees American Airlines Arena emptying out and everybody coming toward them. So he says to Philip, verse 5, Where, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? They're not just 20,000 people. They're 20,000 hungry people. Maybe they're hangry. <laughs> where are we to buy bread so these people may eat? So he puts Philip in this situation. Like Philip's with him like, you guys give me like, we're going to, and then he says this, right? He says, here's what Philip says. He says, um, yeah, verse 7, uh, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. Now, a denarii was one day's wages. So basically, Philip's like, uh, Jesus, you're asking me this question because you could push pause on this hangry crowd coming our way. And I could go work 200 straight days and earn all this money and take it to the bread shop and get all the bread and bring it out. And that still wouldn't be in, like, there ain't no way I got enough for this need. I don't have it. No way, bro. But verse 6 says something. See, in verse 6, it says that Jesus said this to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. Jesus wasn't asking Philip like, oh, snap, that's a lot of people. You got a plan? You got any bread? <laughs> and Philip's like, oh, I could get some from work. And then Jesus is like asking the other disciples, hey, Thomas, what do you think about that? And Thomas is like, well, I doubt that's going to work. And then James and John are like, let's call down. Some of you didn't get that. Jesus knew what he would do. Jesus knew that 20,000 mouths to feed was not a problem for him. Now, Philip's freaking out. Philip's stressed out. But for Jesus, I mean, for the Jesus who, who all of creation was made out of nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and there was no creation. And then he speaks, and bang! creation. Out of nothing, you have everything. So 20,000 people? Well, no problem. But he's saying it to test Philip. Hey, Philip, what are you going to do? What do you think, Philip? Where are you going to look, Philip? What are you going to process? What are you going to think about? Where are you going to go with the reality that this is way beyond what you can handle? That you don't have enough to meet a need. How are you going to respond, Philip? What do you do in a stressful situation? What do you do when your situation is overwhelming, too much? There ain't no chance. You start looking here and you're like, I don't have that. Too much month at the end of the money. Whatever the situation might be, where are you going to go? You look to yourself? You look to your ideas? You look to your plans? You look to your... Or will you look to Jesus? Will you look to his resources and his capacity? Or do you just look to your own and go, I don't got it. I can't do it. There's way too much for Philip to handle. He doesn't have the capacity to meet this need. Is he going to look to himself or is he going to look at who Jesus is? Will he only look at the physical reality? Because what Jesus is often doing is he's saying there's something underneath this. We're talking about bread. We ain't really talking about bread. Chapter ago, we're talking about glass of water, not really talking about glass of water, talking about something deeper, talking about the thirst of your soul. Will you look beyond the physical and start to go, wait a minute, there's the physical and the spiritual connected. What is it that Jesus or God is trying to do here? So what are you going to do, Philip? Philip does what we so often do, which is, 
I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm out. When I think about what's happening in our culture, the culture that we now live in, this fast-paced, super-connected, all these, everything, just it's a million miles an hour. When I think about what's happening to us, people, what I see is this growing trend of stressed out, anxious, overly committed, overly connected, but not really connected people who just want to quit stuff. It's too much. I can't do it. I can't handle it. So we're quitting churches, we're quitting jobs, we're quitting schools, we're quitting relationships, we're quitting commitments, we're just quitting stuff. And the world has gotten to the point now where it's so easy to quit on people. Because you can just text them. You don't even have to look at them. Can't make it. God wouldn't want me stressed out. You know, God, God wants me to just, you know, God wouldn't give me more than I can handle, so I just need some me time. Everyone wants a Jesus. It's like a nice, warm blanket that just in the cool weather, you're just like, ah, that's nice, right? I mean, just Christmas in the manger, and it's, it's nice. He's warm and cuddly, and you know why people think Jesus is like that? Because people don't read their Bibles. The church is not reading its Bible. Christians as a whole are not reading their Bibles. We're not getting to know God through his word. We're hoping somebody posts something cool on social media. Sum it up for me. What is it? Give me a video. Give me an image. Give me something. That's what it is. There we go. Got it. Good. Let's roll. You read your Bible and you see that Jesus constantly puts people in stressful situations. He puts them in crisis. They're hanging out on a boat. What happens? Storm. <laughs> and we just have this idea like he's supposed to just make all of this stuff go away. And, and we're just trying so hard to get to when it's not like that. Guess what? It's always like that. There's always storms. There's always stuff. He puts them in places where they realize they need him. He's bread. You're hungry. He puts us in places where we realize, I don't have it in me. I can't do this. That's the point. You cannot handle your life on your own. You were not made to be alone. You were made to be with him. You don't have the resources so stop looking to yourself because it's empty. And you look to him. That's the point. Hey, Philip, feed these people. I can't do that. Hey, serve in the kids' ministry. I can't do that. I got kids as it is. <laughs> hey, show up. I can't. I'm tired. You know, most of your life is just showing up. Just show up. You said three weeks ago you'd be there. Sounded great then. Crap, is that today? <laughs> Sorry. If you don't have it, then you're exactly in the right spot where you need Jesus, the bread, who sustains you, who provides for you, who is enough for you. When this white boy was moving from the Midwest to Miami-Dade County, I had people say, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> and you know what I said? It may not. <laughs> and then I met a lot of other people who are from all kinds of places. This culture is not anybody's culture. We're all just trying to make our own culture together. We're all from other places, and we're all trying to figure it out. But I said, Lord, if, if you don't sustain me, there's no way I'm going to be able to do what you're asking me to do. No way. And he's like, really? That's the point. 
It's not like I've been doing it on my own my whole life anyway. He's the one who sustains us. We always are to be in a position of need for him. Gotta stop living for like the, well, one day it's gonna be like, how many of you said that? What, well, once, honey, once we get here, well, once we get this much money, well, once we get to this point, well, once we get past this, well, once this, fun, what? And then that happens, and then what? You're there again. And then another one. And you, ever gone, you ever gone hiking in a mountain? I know there's no mountains around here except Mount Trashmore, right? In Cutler Bay. <laughs> But if you ever do, what happens is you go up and you think you got to the top and then you get there and you realize, oh wait, it goes down and back up again. All right, we can take another one. And you go and then it's like, there's another one and it goes down and back up again. Well, you can't see all that when you're down here. You just think you got to the top and then you get there and you're like, bro, we're we going for the next one. <laughs> That's your life. And there's another one and there's another one and there's another one. The entire point is that we are empty and we need him to sustain us. We're hungry. He's the bread. He will provide. I was talking to somebody just yesterday and he said, I didn't have any money. We didn't have any money. And then all of a sudden we got this money and I thought, great, got the money. Thank you. But then I heard I'm supposed to give it away. I got to give this money away. I'm supposed to, I need this money. How can I give this money away if I need it? Doesn't make any sense stressful. It was already stressful, and now it's really stressful, because it's like Jesus is asking me to do something even more stressful. So he gave it away. Came into work the next day, and his boss put a, put a bunch of money on the desk and said, here you go, this is for you. He said, I started crying. He's like, well, he thought it was because he gave me the money. It's not because of how much money he gave me. It's because of the fact that I realized Jesus just provided for me. <laughs> When I needed him, I'm like, I had an encounter with Jesus in my crisis. He led me there. I trusted him, and he provided and met me there, and now I'm crying in front of another grown man. <laughs> yes, you've encountered Jesus. So here they are, and they've got all these hungry people, and they don't have the resources to meet the need. And so what happens? Verse 8, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Hey, um, there's a boy here. He has five barley loaves and two fish, but, yeah, what's that going to do? Jesus said, all right, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number, so about 20,000 possibly people, mouths to feed. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, some of you all need to read that a few times. 20,000 mouths to feed. He's got five loaves of bread and two fish, and he's given thanks. Who would be given thanks at that point for five loaves with that big of a need? Jesus is like, thanks. This is enough. This is good. Watch this. He gives thanks and distributes, distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted and when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. He just performed a miracle. He just took this little bit and multiplied it to feed all of the arena filled with people. Jesus will put us in places where we don't have enough, and he's testing us to see, will you look to him who has enough, or will you look only to yourself and tap out? Notice what the crowds do at this point. In verse 14, it says, when the people saw the sign, like they realized what just happened. Okay, this guy took that kid's bread, and then now we're all full. Wait a second, how does that work? When they saw what he had, that he had done, they said, this indeed... This is indeed the prophet who was to come into the world. Now, as Jewish people, they were familiar with the Old Testament, and they were familiar with this promise of, that Moses gave back in Deuteronomy 18, that there's going to be a prophet. So it says this in Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God, he will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is him you shall listen. Because when Moses, Moses was one who provided bread for his people. 
Okay, longer Old Testament story. And they're going, wait a minute, Moses did that, this guy did that, wait, this is the guy. This is, this, is, this is the one we've been waiting for. And so here's what they do, verse 15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. They're going to take him by force. Hey, wait a minute. Look what he just did. Get him. <laughs> like, we're going to take him. But here's the second thing you have to understand about Jesus that this passage tells us is that Jesus will not let us force him into our agenda. They're thinking, hey, grab the bread guy, because if he did that, man, they're going to force him. And instead, when they try to force him, Jesus is like, deuces, and he's gone. He withdrew again to a mountain. He'd rather be alone on a mountain than be forced into these people's agenda. See, they had this idea that this prophet, this one to come, is going to overthrow all of the oppressors. Okay, so the Jewish people, their land, but now Rome has come, and Rome, the Roman Empire, is taking over, and they're occupying it, and so they're taking, you know, ridiculous amounts and taxes, and they're threatening them, they're killing them, they're oppressing them, they're pushing them around, and so here they are, they're like, we're God's people, and yet we're oppressed by all of this situation, all these people, so the prophet's going to come, and he's going to kick them out. He's going to take over and, you know, we're going to get rid of them and we're going to end our suffering. We're going to have the good life. We're going to have our land back. There's going to be prosperity. There's going to be ease. There's going to be winning. There's going to be comfort. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be the whole thing. They had in mind this political leader. They had in mind the things of this world. And they wanted Jesus to give them all of that. Ah, you're the one to give us this. I saw what you did with the bread. Like, imagine if the bread guy's in office. We'll never, we'll never lose. Grab him. How often do you want to fit Jesus into your agenda? How often do you have your agenda and you're just trying to cram Jesus in there? Jesus, do this. Jesus, do this. God, give me this. Rather than treating Jesus like he's the king of kings, we treat him like Burger King. You can have it your way. You know? Well, Jesus is a, he's a protector, and so he's going to protect everything in my life. And so your whole life is about safety and protection and never taking any risks. Well, Jesus cares for the poor, and so Jesus is a Democrat. Well, Jesus cares for the unborn, so Jesus is a Republican. Hint, Jesus is neither. Well, Jesus wants me healthy. Well, Jesus wants me wealthy. Well, Jesus wants me to have more Instagram followers. And Jesus wants me to be successful. And Jesus wants, Jesus wants me to be happy. And so anybody that, that, that offends me or that's like, you know, like I need, just need to get away from all of that. Because I just want, I just want, oh, I want peaceful. I don't want any. You want peaceful relationships? You know what you have to do to get peaceful relationships? Fight for them. You have to fight for peace. Jesus is not here to serve our agenda of an easy, comfortable American dream. He's not a Build-A-Bear. You know what Build-A-Bear is? Take your smiley little kids there, right? And then they get to, like, stuff the bear with everything that they want. And then they get to dress the bear however they want. And they come out, and they got a cute little bear. And you can have a baseball bear. You can have a soccer bear. You can have a ballet bear. Whatever kind of bear you want, you get to build your own bear. Jesus is not a Build-A-Bear. He's a lion. He's fierce. He's ferocious. He will threaten. He will confront. Jesus is offensive. Lovingly offensive because he's fierce for your good. He's fierce for the glory of God being on display in your life and my life. And so he will come for us and challenge us and offend us. And bother us and make us uncomfortable. And I get that our culture is like overly sensitive, right? We're offended by everything nowadays. Guess what? Jesus didn't care. <laughs> He's lovingly offensive. 
if Jesus agrees with everything in your life, you have not met him yet. If everything in your life is exactly what Jesus would agree, you haven't met him yet. If Jesus is riding shotgun as your homeboy while you're cruising through life, you have not met him yet. You've not met him yet. If Jesus is your casual friend that you visit and say what's up to when you come to church once a month, you haven't met him yet. Jesus will look at you and say, where you been? Because where I've been is with my people. And Jesus is committed to his people. And he calls his people to be committed to one another as they're committed to him. You want to display commitment to Jesus, it walks and is experienced in the reality of being with his people. Well, I just have too much going on in my life. You know, I have this, and I, you know, I need this, and I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got me. Jesus is going, you know what? You just keep building your life on you. And you're wrapping everything around you. And here's the truth. You were made for more than that. Your life was not meant to be about you. In fact, Jesus will say things like, you want life? You want to find life? Lose your life. You want to, you, you want to experience him? Give your life away. Come after me, he says. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. A cross of suffering, a cross of sacrifice, a cross of serving, a cross of giving, a cross of, hey, my life's not about me, it's about him and for the good of others. You want to follow me? Or you just want a nice, you know, Build-A-Bear Jesus? Obey God. Like, like, obey the things you know he's said. We want his blessings, but we won't do the things he's clearly said. Be with my people. Pray. Here. Eat the word. Read this. Some of you are like, man, Steve, what have you been the last few weeks? This is like, I'm talking to myself too. I'm right with you. This is what God is telling us, his people. If you love me. Right? He, this is what he says at, at the end. He tells Peter, he's like, hey, do you love me? He's like, yeah, yeah, of course you know I love you. He's like, good, feed my sheep. Take care of my people. Where you see and experience God is when you see it through his people as the church becomes a people that loves and cares for one another and builds each other up. And in Miami, I get it, we live like this. And we don't trust nobody. And we don't show any weakness or any vulnerability. I'm good. No, you're not. We need each other. We are gifts to one another. God works through his people together. If you love Jesus, if you will sacrifice and serve for him, and for the benefit of his people, so his people can carry out his mission in this city that needs him. Now look how Jesus starts to offend people, because he starts getting offensive. In verse 25, what happens is, I mean, he's gone up on the mountain to get away from them as they were going to take him. And then he, there's a scene where his disciples get in a boat and they go across some water. And Jesus walking on the water, which is kind of a big deal, but we're not going to touch on that right now. And so then people go looking for Jesus, and they're like, all right, and they finally found him. So verse 25, when they found Jesus on the other side of the sea, they said to him, uh, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, verse 26, he says, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, whenever Jesus says truly, truly, he's done messing around. <laughs> like, sit up and listen, because he's going straight for the point, he is not messing around anymore. He's not going to ask questions to get you to think or ponder or wonder, which he does a lot. But when he says truly, truly, he's going for it. Not afraid to offend. Jesus doesn't need anybody's approval. Verse 26, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me. Not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You ate some bread. 
felt good. You want me to do the bread thing again? Hey, bread guy, we're hungry again. There's a song I was listening to by the new Coldplay album, and he talks about when I'm, when I'm hurt, I go to the church, take it to the church. And it's like, so you, only when you're hurting. Now, initially, we're hurting. We come. This should be a hospital. But it's like what happens is you, you go, and then you pull away until, oh, now something else. Now give me this. Okay, now pull away. Okay, now give me this. Now pull away. Now. That ain't what Jesus is talking about. You only come when you want it to feel, when it feels good. And Jesus is like, I'm not playing this game where you, you rub me like a genie and I give you whatever you want. He's calling out their agenda. And sometimes Jesus needs to call out your agenda. You need to listen. You need to be honest and go, wait a minute. I'm settling for something else. I'm just trying to feel good here. I just want this. And so now Jesus is calling it out and he's saying, you're only coming you're only praying, you're only asking because you want something else. But Jesus is saying, I came for something much deeper for you. I love you far more than you know. And the purpose of God in your life and the work of God in your life is far greater. It might be painful. It might be very uncomfortable. But don't interpret that as God doesn't care or God's not good. It just means he's got a really deep work to do in you. But because he's the bread... He will sustain you through it. Don't resist him. Don't fake it. See, Christmas is dangerous. Hey, Christmas. There's a lot going on in here. And Jesus is coming for you saying, truly, truly, you just want the Christmas season to be a certain way. But here's the thing we've got to know about Jesus. Jesus satisfies us with a new kind of life with him. This is it. This is where he's going. He is here to satisfy your hungry soul with a new kind of life, a life with him where he is enough. He doesn't just point out their, their flaw or their, false, their bad motive in verse 26. He continues his fierceness for them in verse 27. He says, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Don't labor for the food that perishes, but the eternal life. Now, some of us that have been in church a long time, we hear eternal life and we think, oh yeah, that's because I asked Jesus in my heart and so when I die, I go to heaven. That ain't it. When the Bible's talking about eternal life, it's not talking about dying and go to heaven. It's talking about dying to yourself now, trusting Jesus now, and having a quality of life with him now that extends all the way into eternity. It's a life with him now, moment by moment, where he's the bread who sustains you. He's the one you feast upon. He's the one you hunger for. He's the one you desire and walk with and get up in the morning and eat and walk through the day and lay down at night and are thankful because he's with you through all of the stuff. Instead of going, well, once we get to heaven, we won't have any more of this stuff. We got stuff all the time. But man, you've got him with you. He sustains you. He does not abandon you or leave you or forsake you. Do not labor for the food that perishes. And I find that so many of us are just constantly laboring for food that perishes. I just, I just need to have a good week. Really? That's what you're living for? What a smooth, easy, comfortable week? Okay, let's pray that Jesus makes you have a nice week. And then maybe you get it. And then guess what? There's another week that comes. And then you're like, oh, well, this one's not so good. And we just live in for one good week after another, one good week after another. No, you're made for more than that. You're made for a Jesus who, though the week may be filled with storms and chaos, there's no chaos and storms in here because he's with you and he sustains you. This is where Jesus is describing this. In the verses that we read when he says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. The people were really having a struggle believing what he says. 
All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I won't cast them out. Like, if you've been in prison, you've been hooked on anything, he will not cast you out. He won't go, ah, uh, yeah, you don't quite make the cut. Psh. That wherever you're at and whatever you have brought to the table, he will not cast you out. All who come to me. He goes on to say, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes. Not everyone who does really good work and tries really hard to make up for all the things they've done wrong. That's not what he says. Because in a, a few verses before that, the people are like, uh, what, do, what kind of works do we need to do to do what God requires? And Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe. To believe in the one whom he has sent. Believe means trust. Lean on. Put all of your hope into. Recognize that you are so hungry and the only one who can satisfy that hunger is Jesus. And he will not cast you out. And he will secure you and keep you and hold you and sustain you until the last day when it's all over. That's what he's inviting us into. That's the life. So there's the question. What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for him? Are you just hungering for him to just take away stuff and make it easier? I think some of us are so frustrated. We're frustrated at our life. We're frustrated at God, and we don't admit it that it's toward God. But here's the deal. If you have frustrating circumstances in your life, you have to take it up with God who allowed those circumstances in your life. And let's not play Christmas time. Let's not play church activity. Let's not play this thing anymore. Let's not waste our time doing that. So as we close, I'm going to pray and we're going to take communion together. We're also going to have, like, if you need to just pray and give it to the Lord, come to these, step, these steps over here. You can kneel down. You can tell him what's going on. God, I am frustrated at this. God, I am sorry. God, this is too much. Maybe, like, this is all too much for me. I can't handle it anymore. Good. Bring it to him. He won't cast you out. He won't shame you. He'll sustain you. Let's come to him. Let's be a people who come together and come to him and watch him sustain us and fill us and be with us through all the stuff that we all have. You're not alone. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that when the scripture says that you will never cast us out, it's because you were cast out for us. When you were on that cross, you were cast out so that we could forever be received and welcomed into the presence of the Father. God, some of us in here today need to say, sorry. I'm tired of eating all the other bread that just doesn't satisfy. Jesus, I'm coming to you. Forgive me. Thank you for what you've done. God, those of us that have been Christians for maybe a long time, we've just at that point where we say, I can't, I don't have enough in me anymore, Lord. God, would you, would you sustain us? We empty ourselves out before you. We confess we need you. In a city that says it's not okay to be, to have need, you have to have it all together. We're a people that says, I don't have it all together. I need you, Lord. Help, sustain Thank you that you're the bread, the 
the bread of life that fills, that satisfies, that sustains us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't want us to just do communion. We do this every week here. And I hear people say it just kind of can become routine. Everything in your life can just kind of become routine. This meal is the, another picture that God has given you to say, my body was broken for you and my blood was shed for you. So take the bread, tear it off, and dip it in the cup as they tell you these words. And then you can take and eat, but let it be a moment where you're saying, you're the bread that I need, Lord. And some of you need to get on your face on these steps over here and just cry out to God. Maybe you have something to confess. You need to confess that to the Lord and you need to use this time to do that. Or you need to ask one of us to pray over you. You're like, I can't even say the words. Let somebody pray over you. But don't just go through the motions. Let's not just pretend like all is good and play church. We're going to take communion. We're going to treasure him. We're going to cry out to him. And we're going to sing together because he's worthy of our praise. So followers of Jesus, when you're ready, come, pray, eat, worship, sing, cry, encourage, love. Let's do this together.